Thank you, Professor Kim. Annyeong haseyo. Dangasuimida. My name is Natalie Hobson, and I work at Jenea Fertility in Sydney, Australia. I look after a number of different laboratories, and um, one of my main roles um, where I work at the moment is introducing new science and novel technologies into our laboratories. So some of the things I'm going to be talking to you today about are some of the interesting things that are happening in embryology that we can actually introduce into our labs. Can I just get a raise of hands as to how many embryologists that we have in the audience today? Great, good to see. <laughs> So first of all, I just really wanted to thank Global Fertility Academy and Merck Sorono for supporting me to come over here today and talk to you all. Um, it's an honour to be able to do this and go over some of the important uh, subjects that were raised at the ESHRA convention uh, in Munich. Um, let's get on with it. So as you can see from the two polls that I've just done, I'm going to be talking a little bit about time lapse. So I've got two uh, topics that are going to be covering about time lapse. One is um, whether time lapse is is actually informative um, in helping embryologists from diverse backgrounds uh, to help select their embryos on a day three um, to to better choose those that might develop into a blastocyst. Um, the second one I'm going to be talking about is a little bit about um, developing some definitions around time-lapse photography um, and time-lapse analysis um, so we can actually better use the, um, the technology of time-lapse and, and able to share results across uh, all of our different laboratories to be able to, um, I guess, help understand what, what's going on and share the information. Um, the next two topics I'm going to be talking about are looking at potential biomarkers um, that uh, possibly can be used in embryology uh, to determine the best embryo to go back um, to increase the implantation results. So I'll get on to the first topic. Um, so this is a, a poster that was presented by Diamond and his cr um, group from America. Um, and it's talking about automated time-lapse analysis and whether it's use with general morphology um, that is used every day in the lab um, is highly, whether that's highly informative in allowing embryos to select, um, embryologists to set, select embryos with a um, higher potential. So the aim of this um, and, and the background, I guess, is we already know that there are um, that there's a lot of embryos that we choose that are very good quality blastocysts and they fail to implant, or day three embryos that we choose and they fail to implant. And what what we're really after is more technologies that we can use that can actually help our selection process. It has already been shown, and there's a lot of work out there. Um, that time-lapse uh, systems can benefit embryo selection. Um, and Conaghan's group, which is the sun, from the same group as um, this paper, um, has actually already talked about that time-lapse can help embryologists that are highly experienced in the laboratory. Um, and this particular paper looks at whether or not the use of time-lapse can be helpful to those embryologists with less experience. So for those of you who are working in labs where you've, when you've got a single embryologist with not as much experience, whether well, time lapse can actually help those embryologists as well and help in selecting the right embryo. So the aim of this paper was to sort of look at whether or not the use of time lapse um, in conjunction with the regular morphology um, choice um, is informative uh, and helpful for embryologists from diverse backgrounds. So this was a prospective multi-centre trial which went over just under a year. Um, there were 54 patients that were, had consented to um, undergoing blastocyst transfer cycles. 
and they consented to have their embryos imaged using the EVA system. So um, can I just get a raise of hands of anyone who practices in a laboratory with time lapse? Has anyone got a time lapse system in their laboratory? Not too many people. Great, thank you. Um, so the five embryologists that they looked at had diverse training and experience. Um, and then they basically were looking at whether or not, um, so splitting the two groups and looking at whether morphology alone compared to morphology and using time lapse and, and what the, the difference in the um, predictive blast assist rates were. Um, so to, to really measure this, uh, they looked at the odds ratio. So what are the odds of an embryologist looking at a day three embryo and saying, yes, that embryo is going to reach a blastocyst stage? So uh, just quickly, so we, we know they've split it into two groups. So we've got morphology only group, and then we've got morphology followed by time lapse. So morphology only, we're looking at the green circle, uh, so the smaller circle is all of the embryos on day three and whether the embryologist can predict which of those embryos will get onto a blastocyst stage. And we can see that the odds ratio is 1.68. When we look on the right hand side with morphology and time lapse, when we're looking at all of the embryos on day three, that odds ratio increases to two, just over 2.5. So that's fantastic that uh, time lapse is, is helping those embryologists. And when you actually then stratify the group further down and they're looking at just those embryos which are very good quality on day three, and these are the embryos that are very difficult to actually choose uh, between which is the best one to go back. Um, so when you look at those good quality embryos on day three, we actually see the odds ratio increase again to 3.5. Um, which is, uh, is, is really showing that, that time lapse is helping those embryologists to choose the right embryo to go back. And interestingly, uh, you can see in the green the, the use of time lapse and morphology together is also lifting the odds ratio up for every single embryologist, regardless of experience. And uh, it's actually reducing the variability as well. So those confidence intervals in those green bars are, um, uh, there's not as much variance in there. So the conclusion for this particular paper was that uh, the results are showing that the use of time lapse in conjunction with general morphology grading of embryos uh, is, is helpful and informative of em, uh, for embryologists to actually select the right embryo to go back. And so what does it mean for you as clinicians? Well, it means that there's, um, so that successful development of the blastocyst, which is critical milestone that's associated with implantation potential. Um, and, you know, in specifically related to cleavage stage embryos. So these results suggest that the use of an integrated time-lapse analysis system as well as the general morphology grading may improve overall success rates when used to select embryos. Okay, so on to my next uh, paper that was presented, which also centres around time-lapse. Um, this is uh, a quick discussion regarding um, the need for definitions and terminology around time lapse in order to be able to uh, share that information and present papers which are standardised um, across the topic of time lapse. So we know that there's a, already an increasing quality, quantity of time lapse imaging and, um, and it has already been de demonstrated to add some clinical value uh, for mor morphokinetic data collection. Um, there's several articles out there that have identified similar embryo selection or deselection variables, but a lot of them have got different terms that they're using um, across the papers that are being written. And there's a lot of there's an evidence-based consensus on general static embryo grading out there. So you've got the um, alpha consensus paper on embryo grading. 
but nothing as yet exists for definitions and terminology around time lapse and the use of uh, the wording around that. So the aim of this paper was to uh, define the approach and terminology for the dynamic monitoring and pre-implantation embryo development. So in, in order to improve the utilisation of this uh, novel technology. So um, there was a series of consensus meetings that had been held uh, between September 2011 and June 2013. And they involved expert time-lapse users uh, from seven different European countries. And the group have reached a consensus on commonly identified time-lapse variables. And these guidelines will be published in future. I have had a look and I can't see the, a, a date yet, but um, it, it is coming. So some of the topics that's going to be covered in the consensus guidelines, um, I'm not going to read them all, but um, you know, talking a little bit about when and how to annotate the first cleavage and subsequent cleavage, cleavage events. Um, the cytoplasmic wave, pronuclear appearance and fading, compaction, blastulation and collapse, direct and reverse cleavage events. They're, they're all up there, so really every aspect. And, and this isn't uh, all, of the, all of them that they're going to sort of be looking at. Anything else that comes up um, in the meantime, they will also be um, reviewing um, and adding to this um, consensus. So the conclusion to this paper was that although not yet published, these guidelines will represent the first consensus of time-lapse imaging proposed by clinical scientists. And a systematic evaluation of current evidence and theory was undertaken to reach this consensus. And it's on a uniform methodology and terminology for the use and the study of time-lapse imaging and its clinical application in IVF. So what does that mean for clinicians? It means that the adoption of these uniform approaches to the terminology and definitions of morph morphokinetic time-lapse variables would allow improved interpretation and sharing of data which could impact positively on the patient treatment outcome. So the next two papers I'm going to be talking about are um, looking at some uh, new novel biomarkers that could possibly be used um, in helping the embryo selection process. So the first one is looking at cell-free DNA levels in follicular fluid as a non-invasive biomarker of in vitro fertilisation outcomes. So I know the big topic the last couple of years um, has always been about looking at other ways, non-invasive ways, other than grading of, of how we can actually select embryos at an early stage to see what potential that they have for implantation. So this study looks at DNA fragments resulting, um, well, they know that DNA fragments result from inflammatory and apoptotic and necrotic events, and they're present in blood circulation, um, and their quantification are currently used for the detection of other gyne gynaecological and pregnancy disorders. So we already know that. And we know that follicular fluid, which constitutes a oocyte microenvironment, contains both, both plasma components and secreted em elements from the granulosa cells. So the presence of cell-free DNA in follicular fluid has actually never been investigated. And ne neither have that has its potential to be used as an IVF predictor um, or I IVF biomarker. So the aim of this study was to examine if there was any cell-free DNA present in follicular fluid from pre-ovulatory individual follicles. And if so, whether it was stable enough to assess if it's correlated with IVF outcomes. So there was a 100 individual follicular fluid collections from 44 patients undergoing conventional IVF. So 26 in the X, in IVF group and 18 in the ICSI group. Now, the collection of flo follicular fluid and the grading of the, were based on the volume that with, was withdrawn from the follicle, not the actual size on the ultrasound. And um, 
they had to have clear follicular fluid, so no blood products in there, which is probably why we've only got um, 44 um, samples there, from, well, 100 samples from 44 patients. So the ovulatory pre-ovulatory follicles were aspirated individually, and the follicle size was calculated based on that volume. Um, and each corresponding cumulus suicide complex was isolated for IVF or ICSI. Um, and the cell-free DNA was quantified by a quantitative PCR, and the results were correlated with pregnancy outcomes. So um, what they actually found was there's a significant and negative correlation between cell-free DNA and follicle size was, was observed. So that is saying that the larger follicles had less cell-free DNA. Um, so cell-free DNA is, is indicative of optoptic, 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 I can't say, <laughs> um, necrotic events. Um, so what we want to see is a lower rate of cell-free cell DNA present in the follicular fluid, which we can see here. And when isolating to uh, follicles that only had, that had a oocyte present, we can see the same trend downwards, which is significant. And when stratifying that group further into looking at the, the eventual grading of these embryos on day three, we're again finding that those embryos that had high cell-free DNA in the follicular fluid are actually showing a poorer grade in their embryo on day three. And also looking at um, the developmental stage of the embryo on day three, again, we're seeing a correlation between high levels of follicular fluid, oh, sorry, high levels of DNA in the follicular fluid um, and, a, and a delayed response in development of these embryos, as well as a higher fragmentation rate of those embryos as well. So the conclusions for this particular paper was that cell-free DNA was detected in human follicular fluid, and its level did vary significantly according to the follicle size. And that cell-free DNA levels in follicular fluid were significantly correlated with embryo quality in patients undergoing the IVF process. So what does that mean for you as clinicians? Well, it means that high cell-free DNA amounts in the follicle could have negative effects on the oocyte and then embryo health. And that cell-free DNA measurement in follicles is easily performed and could be used as a supplement, supplemental non-invasive tool to predict embryo quality for the IVF process. So what needs to happen next is a larger study needs to be conducted to investigate if cell-free DNA levels could be correlated with embryo implantation and pregnancy rates. So we're looking at the moment, we know now that it's impacting the embryo's development on day three and whether that has a further impact on the implantation of that, those embryos. The last paper I'm going to be talking about today is another uh, potential biomarker that we can use in helping the embryo selection process. Uh, it talks a little bit about secreted microRNAs, um, which can be profiled with high accuracy and reproducibility from blastocyst-spent culture media. And it's a potential new biomarker for non-invasive embryo selection. So what do we already know about potential biomarkers um, and microRNAs? Well, in the last dec decade, it's been hypothesized that microRNAs could be extracellularly stable, meaning able to be measured. Um, so the resulting evidence was that microRNAs secreted by donor cells can be taken up by recipient cells and exert a gene regulatory effect upon them. And accordingly, human embryos could secrete specific microRNAs as part of the blastocyst endometrial dialogue to enhance the implantation um, success of those embryos. So profiling the RMA repertoire in easily collectible spent culture media holds the potential to identify non-invasive biomarkers of embryo quality. So the aim of this paper was to assess firstly whether or not human embryos secrete microRNAs in the extracellular environment, and if so, 
whether it was possible to examine these microRNAs and profile them um, to actually determine whether or not the, the potential of the, of the embryo. So the study um, undertook uh, 10 good quality embryos at a blastocyst stage um, that were donated to research. And they underwent inner cell mass isolation to remove that. And then the trifectoderm samples uh, were cultured um, and the spent culture media was then collected and where they were individually processed for microRNA. So the microRNA expression was evaluated using the TLDA microRNA cards. Um, the primer sets for 736 human microRNA sequences and the results were analysed. So an average number of 48 different microRNAs were detected in blastocyst spent culture media. And comparative analysis with other trifectoderm samples revealed that 98.8 or 79 out of 80 microRNAs found in at least one medium was also express, expressed in the trifectoderm. So functional bioinformatics analysis has revealed that some of the microRNAs found in the media have been associated already and validated with, uh, as circulating microRNAs including those associated with the endometrium receptivity, angiogenesis, placental function, and stem cell regulation. So this paper went on to um, quickly look at whether or not those microRNAs were significantly more abundant in conditioned spent culture media of euploid implanted embryos, which they actually did find that there was an, an increase in that. Um, so there's a lot of the microRNAs out there, but there, are, there really were an, the four that I mentioned that are, are really have already been shown to increase the implantation potential um, uh, in circulating, with circulating microRNAs. So the conclusions of this is that microRNAs are secreted from human blastocysts in culture media and they are in appropriate concentrations um, and stability to be profiled with high accuracy and reproducibility. And that several microRNAs were found to be of unique expression or more, or more abundant in conditioned culture media of implanted blastocysts. So what does this mean? Well, it means that to fully exploit the clinical translational relevance of these findings, further prospective studies are underway to identify uh, key secreted microRNAs that can be used to predict de developmental competence of pre-implantation embryos based, of, based on quantification of secreted microRNAs from spent culture media. So I think what that's saying is that they need to do more studies about that, but in fact they are quite positive that some of these microRNAs that they're finding in the spent culture media are going to be a good tool for selecting embryos with high implantation potential. So in summary, um, two papers that I talked about, the first two are, um, were based around time lapse. Um, and the first one is that an integrated time-lapse automated analysis system when used adjunctively with morphology is informative in helping embryologists with various levels of experience select embryos with high developmental potential. So we're talking embryos on day three, selecting the best one to go back, which has the potential to develop into a blastocyst and implant. The second paper on time-lapse was about a consensus being reached about the different um, definitions and terminology to be used um, for time-lapse monitoring in order to improve the utilisation and the impact of this novel technology. The next two papers were based on uh, new novel biomarkers. Um, the first being that high cell-free DNA levels in the follicle could have negative effects on the oocyte and thus embryo health. So cell-free DNA measurements in follicles is easily performed 
and could be used as a supplemental non-invasive tool to predict embryo quality. And the last paper that I covered was talking a little bit about microRNAs and that they're secreted from human blastocysts in culture media in sufficient concentrations to be profiled with high accuracy and reproducibility. Several microRNAs were also found to be of unique expression or more abundant in the conditioned culture media of implanted blastocysts. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. And <laughs>